Every superhero changes the world using awesome powers, whether they are born with them, acquire them through some sort of gamma ray accident, or devise them using their tech savvy. And people who study chemistry have a superpower of their own, the ability to see ions within reactions. It's like being able to see through walls or decode secret messages at lightning speed. But don't worry, no one needs to be dropped into a vat of radioactive goo to acquire the ability to do this. All we need is practice to harness ion vision and gain an understanding of ionic equations. Hi, I'm Will Komar, and welcome back to Study Hall Chemistry, presented by Arizona State University and Crash Course. Let's dive in. So I'm wearing my ion vision glasses today to help explain how we'll learn to see ionic equations. They're mainly a fashion statement because the power is all in our minds, but let's pretend they're a superhero gadget and analyze these specs. What makes these ion vision glasses helpful is that one lens looks at the chemical reaction written out the way we're familiar with, and one lens translates that into what's happening to the ions within it. Another way of saying this is that in chemistry, we can view reactions with ionic compounds in two ways. There's molecular equations, where the compounds are all written out in their chemical formulas. This is what we're used to seeing, but we can also look at their free ions, the ions that make up these compounds, as if they were dissolved in solution. This view is the ionic equation. Seeing both equations helps us get the whole picture of what's happening in a reaction. We don't necessarily need special fashion statements or cool gadgets to identify the molecular and ionic equations when we come across them, though. It's a talent we can acquire with practice. As an example, let's start with the precipitation reaction between aqueous silver nitrate and an aqueous sodium chloride solution. If we draw from our previous understanding of chemical reaction types, we can also classify this as a double displacement reaction, so we know what the products will be. A solid precipitate of silver chloride and aqueous sodium nitrate. This final written reaction is our molecular equation. Let's try our ion vision next to figure out what's happening to the ions. This shows that silver nitrate and sodium chloride have the free ions of silver, nitrate, sodium, and chloride. As for the products, we just have ions from sodium nitrate, since the precipitate silver chloride is an insoluble solid and therefore it doesn't dissociate. When the free ions are split up this way, they're called dissociated ions. We don't split nitrate up into nitrogen and oxygen, though. Nitrate is a polyatomic molecule that has a negative charge, but it's made from covalent bonds instead of ionic ones. As a refresher, covalent bonds form when atoms share electrons, whereas ionic bonds form when atoms donate electrons. Since nitrate is made of covalent bonds, its elements do not dissociate into ions. So we refer to the whole nitrate compound as an anion. Now, if we line up these dissociated ions added together as reactants and products the same way we did for the molecular equation, we get our ionic equation. It's not as simplified as it can be, but for now, we can call this completed example step one to mastering our superpower. If this was a movie, we'd probably put in some sort of training montage right about now. For us though, that montage will likely be practice problems. Even though doing practice sets isn't as fun to watch as someone finally climbing up a tall building like a spider, it's still a surefire way to become an expert at identifying ionic equations. So let's try our ion vision on another double displacement reaction, this time between aqueous sodium hydroxide and aqueous magnesium chloride. The first thing it'll help us do is to predict the products. We can swap the cation and anion partners from the reactants. Since we have sodium bonded to hydroxide and magnesium bonded to chloride here, we can expect sodium will bond with chloride and magnesium with hydroxide in the products. We're dealing with ions, so we can use a crossover rule when working with magnesium, which has a positive two charge. Like we said in episode four, that two in magnesium's charge becomes a subscript in the compound it forms with either chloride in the reactants or hydroxide in the products. It's important to remember here that charges are not the same as atoms. A positive two charge in the magnesium ion does not mean we have two magnesium atoms. It's just showing how many electrons can go into that atom's outer shell or how many it can give away. We need two chloride or hydroxide molecules here because the charges on each side of the equation must balance. Both of these atoms have a negative one charge. The two atoms have a combined charge of negative two, which can cancel the single magnesium's positive two charge. Our result is sodium chloride and magnesium hydroxide. Now we need to balance the reaction, adding a coefficient to sodium hydroxide and sodium chloride. Next, we need to find the states of matter for our products. Let's draw upon what we discussed last episode and quickly check a solubility chart to find out what the states of matter of those products are. This one reads more like a flowchart. So if we follow the format, it looks like sodium and chloride are soluble in solution. 
So we'll mark the compound they form as aqueous. The anion hydroxide is insoluble though. So we can say magnesium hydroxide is insoluble and will form a solid precipitate. Now we have our final balanced molecular equation. Now that it's balanced, we can use ion vision to find the ionic equation. It's very similar to what we just did to split out our partners, but now we're aided by the states of matter and the coefficients balancing the reaction. We can check that the charges on each side are also balanced. Let's revisit those partners and make sure the coefficients carry through correctly. We end up with two sodium cations, two hydroxide anions, one magnesium cation, and one chloride anion in the reactants. In the products, we have two sodium cations, two chloride anions, and our insoluble magnesium hydroxide solid, which we'll keep as one compound since it's not dissociated in solution. This becomes our ionic equation, shown as it would exist in an aqueous solution. Now that we've got our molecular and ionic equations, we need to know what to do with them. Like, superpowers are awesome, but we need a reason to use them. So let's see what we can do with our ionic equations by getting on test two. In most superhero stories, there's usually a big showdown against a supervillain set against the backdrop of a big city. But a big city means lots of civilians. They're not involved in the fight between you and your arch enemy, they just witness the action. The same thing happens in ionic equations when not every ion participates in the main reaction. Some of them are just along for the ride, and we call these spectator ions. Just as a superhero needs to differentiate between witnesses and villains, we need to differentiate between spectator ions and the rest of the reaction to see what's actually changing. Let's use ion vision and the ionic equation we just talked about as an example. This equation has all our ions, so we call this the complete ionic equation. Let's cancel out any ions that show up in the same amounts on both sides of the reaction. There are unchanged spectators. We won't get rid of anything in a solid compound since that's not dissociated in the ions but we can cross out the two sodium cations from both sides, as well as the two chloride anions. What we're left with, we can then simplify into the net ionic equation are only the ions participating in the reaction. This condensed form of the equation summarizes what's really going on here, the formation of magnesium hydroxide. Another day saved. Thanks, test two. If we go back to our first reaction example in this episode, we can follow the same process we just did to simplify it down to its net ionic equation. We'll cross out the spectator ions, nitrate and sodium, to get a simplified reaction showing the generation of the silver chloride precipitate. Of course, there are reactions like these with calcium nitrate and sodium chloride where all the components, the reactants and the products are aqueous. This means we don't have an insoluble compound in the reaction. Using ion vision just breaks up all the compounds into their dissociated ions. There's nothing to pick out from the crowd. When this is the case, what we'll see is that our elimination of ions on both sides of the ionic equation ends up canceling out everything. When there's nothing left standing, that means everything has dissolved and there's no reaction. All that's happened is the formation of a solution, which is called dissolution. Ion vision is not just for the world of blockbuster heroes. There are lots of real life applications for ionic equations and recognizing which are reactions and which are simply dissolutions. Primarily, ionic equations will help us better understand solubility now that we've talked about both. And these principles of chemistry are extra important in industries like water treatment. For example, since most chloride ions are soluble in water, its compounds are often used in water purification plants to disaffect water by killing germs and making it safer to drink. It's also common for us to need to treat water that has high or low mineral content. If it's too high in minerals, we call that hard water, which needs to be softened with soluble sodium or potassium ions to avoid scale or buildup of mineral content on bathtubs or inside pipes. That buildup comes from compounds like calcium carbonate or magnesium hydroxide, which we've proven in this episode are insoluble in water. And the applications don't stop there. Iron solubility is another example of the importance of ionic equations. In Hawaii, the soil has a high iron content, but pineapple plants still can't absorb the iron they need because it's in an insoluble compound. We actually have to add soluble iron to the soil for the plants to get that sweet, sweet pineapple we know and love. The opportunities to exercise the powers granted to us by understanding ionic equations are everywhere. Now that we're able to identify net ionic reactions, distinguish molecular equations from their dissociated ions, and figure out whether or not a reaction is even occurring, we can start examining tougher reactions with confidence in our abilities. We are going to need a working knowledge of ion vision and ionic equations as we continue in this series, because we have yet to tackle one of the most important foundations of chemistry, 
one that builds upon everything we've covered so far. Next time, we'll start talking about the mold. Thanks for watching Study Hall Chemistry, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video and you want to keep learning with us here in Study Hall, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about ASU and the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See y'all next time.